Today's message is God, money, and miracles. Everybody say God, money, and miracles. That title should have your interest, right? That should have your attention. Those of you joining us us online, thank you very much for being here. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the channel, like this video, share it with your friends, make sure that they can hear the word of God as well. There are a lot of people in the church world that the Bible calls false apostles. Okay, how can we identify them? Well, there's a number of different ways, but if I could pick one verse to just make it easy, I'd pick this one. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. It says this, unlike so many, everybody say so many. many. Isn't that unfortunate? Paul's writing to the church and he's saying many are doing this, what he's about to say. (laughs) Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. The Greek word there for pedal indicates selling merchandise. Isn't that interesting? We do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Rich, why aren't you selling books, T-shirts and coffee at church? Why aren't you selling tickets to conferences? Because I refuse to pedal the word of God for profit. This doesn't mean that a minister doesn't receive money from, you know, doing ministry, but it's all by generosity and donation. It's never by selling, never by selling. You will not find Jesus selling anything. You will not find Peter selling anything. You'll not find Paul selling anything related to the ministry of the gospel. Paul was a tent maker. I'm sure he sold tents. That's fine. I can buy and sell in the marketplace. That's not the issue. The word of God is not to be peddled. This is important to understand. The word of God is not for sale. Not that I recommend seeing this movie, but I'm reminded of, oh, brother, where art thou? There's a scene with the Bible salesman. He's this awful guy. I think he's played by John Goodman. He's this awful guy who sells Bibles. Folks, this really is bad. Okay, I know, I get it. Lots of people sell Bibles. It's wrong. Why? Well, because Gideon has shown us that they can raise all the money they need to put a Bible in every hotel room in America. Okay, so you can fundraise for Bibles. You don't have to sell them. So there's this Bible salesman in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And uh, he's, he's peddling the word of God, literally the sale of the Bible to these to George Clooney and the other guy. And again, I don't, we don't even really watch movies anymore. This is years ago. I'm just using it as a sermon illustration. Okay, so he's peddling the word of God. Well, then he takes them out and on a journey and they're out in the field. They're sitting under a tree, eating a sandwich and kind of enjoying their time together. And he suddenly grabs this big stick and he breaks, I think he breaks it off of the tree. (laughs) Yeah, he does. He walks over and he breaks this big stick off of the tree. And then he goes and he slaps him across the face with corn flies out of his mouth. And Clooney goes, what's going on, Big Dan? (laughs) And he beats them. And guess what he does? Takes their money. Takes their money. Now, when I think about peddling the word of God, I think of that man. Why do I bring that up? I literally think of Big Dan from Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That that's what it's like spiritually. Hey, I've got truth. I've got something really valuable. Boom, give me your money. It's wicked. And Paul says, many are doing this, peddling the word of God for profit. This is the early church, and they already are cashing in. We see this in the book of Acts. Peter encounters this with Simon the sorcerer. Do you remember the story of Simon the sorcerer? Simon the sorcerer is called the mighty man of God. He's not yet a Christian because he could do some sorcery. He would work some miracles by sorcery. This is similar to the sorcerers uh, in Moses' day who could work some miracles by the power of demons. And so he's a sorcerer. Well, he hears the gospel and he believes it and he gets baptized. Problem is he wasn't right with God, though. He didn't actually get fully right with God. I think a lot of people are this way. They've been baptized after hearing the gospel and the some level of belief is there, but they're not fully in there. And here's what happens. He sees that people are being healed by the laying on of hands. And he goes to Peter and he says, how much? I'm paraphrasing the story, but he's, 
How much? How much for this power that you have? How much for the Holy Spirit? Right? And what does he do? Peter responds and he goes, may your money perish with you. For you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part nor share in this ministry because I can see that your heart is not right before God for you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Where you have buying and selling in the church, regardless of whether someone's baptized, you have Big Dan, you have Simon the Sorcerer, you have people who are full of bitterness and are captive to sin. Because I am so convicted with the Holy Spirit in me regarding the Word of God, I can't sell anything. I take seriously that Jesus flipped the tables in the temple. God convicted me because I had ads on my YouTube videos that were biblically related. He said, legacy, that's fine because it's charity and the money can go to the charity. But all your sermons and Bible teachings take off all the ads. So I turned off all the ads, folks. Not only can I not sell, I couldn't even sell, show ads. And you know what? I agreed with him. It wasn't like he had to, you know hurt me to get me to do it, right? <laughs> pop out, pop out the hip. <laughs> I agreed with him because, for example, some of my videos, they'd pull up these really worldly ads. Yes. And boy, it really disappointed me if somebody would click that away and then they didn't hear the word of God. That's just yeah. not good. And so God was like, yeah, buddy, turn them off. Okay, dad. So we're not supposed to peddle the word of God for profit. This reveals something about the preacher, and I don't care how solid their theology is. They are lacking in faith for God's provision. And do you really want to follow someone who lacks faith that God will pay their bills? Do you also want to follow someone who is living in luxury? I'm not saying needs met. Priests have always throughout the Bible, when people are doing the right thing, they're tithing, and the priests do live off of the tithe, and they distribute it to the poor. There's nothing wrong or evil about that. Abraham tithed to Mel- Well, Abel tithed it in the garden, then Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, and then, of course, Israel tithed to Aaron, and then the New Covenant Church was tithing to the apostles, and then they were distributing to people in need. So there's nothing wrong with that. But that's all based on generosity. It's not the sale of merchandise. And so if you've got preachers, again, I don't care how solid their theology is. If you've got preachers who are peddling the word of God for profit, find a different preacher. Because they don't actually have faith. And if they don't have faith, how could they teach you faith? I'm serious. It takes faith to leave your business and start a charity for orphans. Where does faith come from? The word of God. It doesn't originate in me. But if somebody's really taking in the word of God, their faith grows and you'll see it in their actions. So look for preachers that are not peddling the word of God for profit. I don't care how much you like them. If they sell tickets to conferences, they lack faith in God's provision. They lack faith. Why should they be shepherding the flock if they don't have faith? Pay attention, church. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, I've been going through the Old Testament. I'm in Ezekiel now. I've been going through. And false prophets are talked about quite a bit. They would always prophesy lies and good things. They'd always tell you what your itching ears want to hear, which is what Paul warned Timothy. That in the last days, people would not stick to sound doctrine, but because they had itching ears, they would gather around themselves a great number of teachers who would tell them what they want to hear. And Israel did it too. There's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said. It's just all the same. There's nothing new. This is new covenant Holy Spirit filled, miracle, thriving church, people peddling the word of God for profit. Ananias and Sapphira wanted honor. It, this was related to money. They weren't selling merchandise to the church, but they wanted the honor of giving. So they sold stuff 
and then they only gave a portion, but said they gave all. And Peter said, you could have just given a portion, that's fine, but you lied to the Holy Spirit and you said you gave all because you wanted the honor of the other Christians and they both fell over dead. God takes this money stuff very seriously. So be mindful of who you're listening to and how they behave with money. If they're charging for tickets, if they're charging for commentaries and books, what that tells you is they have a greedy heart needing to live on luxury because God providing them a nice little three, two in a nice little neighborhood is not enough for them. If God's really God, he'll give me a mansion. No, enjoy the mansion in heaven. Jesus says on earth, sell possessions. Isn't that what we talked about last week? So we're picking up from that last week to talk about this. And that is God, money and miracles and how they're actually tied together. And be mindful. There are fake miracles, too. I watched a gentleman not going to use names. Just watched a gentleman. Has a church here in the United States. Good luck trying to figure out who I'm talking about. And, and um, dressed really nice, drove a nice car. And was preaching healing. Nothing wrong with that. And that's the thing, too. The, the message of healing is in the Bible. So there's nothing wrong with that. But then he had a woman come up who was in a wheelchair, said she had been in a wheelchair for five years. Okay. Praise for her. Cast the devil out of her. All the things. I don't have a problem with those things. But here's what I had a problem with. When she stood up from the wheelchair, everyone's cheering. The crowd is way more excited than she is. She's barely even excited. Yeah, she's barely excited. Barely. She's walking kind of like half smirked. Yeah. Well, pay attention. Real healings. <laughs> People are thrilled. Yes. Absolutely. Leaping and praising God. My, this doesn't hurt. Yeah, right? I can walk after fi five years. It was yeah, some right. sort of sickness, yeah. according to them. Okay. Yeah. So, wow. what's that result in? Right? Come buy tickets to the next conference to see more fake people get out of wheelchairs. See, I want to see real healing. So, I refuse to manufacture it. I refuse. Now, a person at a church service that I'm doing can lie. But what I'm saying is that came off to me as someone who was hired. That's what it came off as. And that's not the only time I've seen that stuff. I, you know, if you pay attention, I know. OK, anywhere healing's being preached, people are getting healed. But sometimes to like get it going, they do these fake healings. Does that make sense? And that's no good. So be mindful if they're selling stuff. You know that God didn't charge the preacher to receive the wisdom that he then wrote into a book. But then the preacher charged you where to get that from. If God didn't charge him, but he charges you where to get it from his flesh, not the spirit. Right. What does the scripture say? Jesus said this freely. You've received freely give. And he lists that among miracles. Right. He says, heal the sick, drive out demons. Right. And then he says, freely, you've received freely give. Amen. He lists miracles and he says, make sure it's all free. So anywhere you see miracle ministry, make sure it's free. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying people haven't gotten healed at these mi miracle ministries that cost money. All I'm saying is we need a total reformation. The group that doesn't believe that healing is for today or is only sometimes or that sickness is God's will is just as wrong as the group that believes it's for today and is charging for it and is manufacturing it. Both groups need reformation. And it's okay to make that case that both groups need reformation. So today we're going to do a little bit of that reforming. And we're going to start with why we're not seeing miracles like we did in the Bible, like we have. If you study Christian history, there's been seasons where the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk on a much more regular basis. There's been seasons. So today we're talking about God, money and miracles. And we're going to talk about the relationship between them and why we're not seeing them, what their hindrances are. Are you interested in that? Yes. yes. Me too. I'm excited for the sermon because it's the Holy Spirit. So I get to hear it as well. 
Luke 16. Starting from verse 11. Uh, I was reading the NIV. You know what? We can switch back to the literal word. You can use either. Literal word's nice because if we want to pull up the Greek and the Hebrew, we can very easily. Okay. Verse 11. Again, we're tying into last week, but we're going to expound further. Verse 11, Luke 16, 11. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? It doesn't take a genius to figure out what the true riches are. Just take a moment to ponder that. What can he possibly... So, okay, so money is not the true riches. But on earth, isn't money pretty much like the highest goal? In the earthly sense, more money. More money means all kinds of things, right? So in the earthly sense, more money is the deal. He says there's true riches. True riches. What are the true riches? Well, I'm submitting it to you right now that the true riches are the power of God. Wouldn't you agree that Elisha and Elijah's power was better than money? Okay, so it's pretty easy to identify. Wouldn't you agree that being able to lift up the paralyzed is better than having a bunch of money? Amen. Wouldn't you agree that raising the dead is better than that guy who just won $1.6 billion or whatever? Which, by the way, don't play the lottery. No, I'm not kidding. It is, it's called the poor man's tax for a reason. Don't play the lottery. You know how much money went to taxes? More than half. Guy left with 400 million. He won over a billion. Left with 400 million. Don't, don't play it. Since we're on the topic of money, don't do it. It's just gamble. It's just an extra tax. You don't need to pay it. Okay? Trust God to provide for you. Amen. All right. <laughs> the Lord is healing hearts regarding money. So what's better, raising the dead or winning the lottery? It's raising the dead. dead. It really is. If you don't think that it is, your wires are crossed. Okay, that's what Jesus is talking about. If you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? He's saying, if we're not faithful with earthly money, he can't let you raise the dead. Why? Why? Because you will use it like Simon the Sorcerer and you will peddle it for profit. Is that not what we see? We already see it. Even with minor miracles. As soon as somebody starts walking in even minor miracles, what do they do? Selling conference tickets, baby. 70 bucks a pop. Thousands of people come. They walk out with a six figure. Bless God. It is evil. I'm not saying that the message of healing is evil or the message of miracles. No, in fact, I'm going to preach healing and miracles today. That's not evil. But don't don't copy these guys. This reminds me of what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Do everything they teach you, but don't do what they do. Don't throw out healing. See, there's this group of Christians, pretty large group, that because of the manufacturing and falsehoods and luxury and all that, that they rightly identify as wrong, they literally throw out healing. Too. Don't be that group, but also don't be this group. Jesus was a poor man who had nowhere to lay his head. You got a mansion in heaven. Jesus said, Sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Just let God meet your basic needs here and use the abundance to help others. You'll be glad you did because you'll start walking in miracles. See, that's what I'm getting at today. You'll start to walk in miracles when you do the right thing with money. How could that be tied together? It's right here, Luke 16, 11. Look at verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. If your desire from serving God is, 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 is that he gets you more things, if your desire to serve him comes from he'll give you more things, Because the preacher told you that, look, God gave me more things. I'm not sure God did, buddy. You sold tickets to events. That's you. Because when I read what God says, he pretty often says, "Uh, get rid of it. It's an idol. Tithe it. Give it. Just eat what you need. Live in the size home that you need. All that. 
be modest in all things. Even, even uh, Solomon talked about, give me neither poverty nor riches. Now, Solomon was extremely rich. But if you notice, if you actually study Solomon, people, they really rag on him because he had a thousand wives. Okay. Understand what took place, though. He would marry widows often. And then they would have the literal, the kingdom's dowry. You understand? So it was actually economic. It wasn't just all that, that people see people insult these people in the Bible without really considering what's taking place. It wasn't wrong for him to provide for a bunch of families. Okay. Now, that being said, he was extremely wealthy, but he was extremely generous. Extre when I say extremely generous, Israel did the best they've ever done, not because he just filled his coffers, but because he was distributing it to people in need. That's why Israel was so wealthy during the time of Solomon. Because Solomon was at the top and he was generous. Does that make sense? Isn't God at the top and he's the richest one of us and he's generous? That's what Solomon represented. You cannot serve God in wealth. Solomon said, give me neither poverty nor riches. Neither poverty because I don't want to steal, which would be to break God's commandments, and neither riches because my heart could become hard and I could turn against the living God. That was his point. I know Jonathan likes Solomon, so you'll appreciate that. One greater than Solomon is here, they said about Jesus. Listen, we don't want poverty. We don't want riches. If God brings riches in, they're to be distributed. We don't want poverty. We don't want riches. We want what we need and we want to share. That's really what the Bible teaches for Christians. And you see it. It happened in the early church and they walked in signs, wonders and miracles. And I'll prove it to you. Let's look at Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four. I want to tie money and miracles together for you because it is here in the Bible and I want you to see it. So you cannot serve God in money. You will not be trusted with true riches if you don't handle earthly wealth correctly. Right? Now let's look at Acts chapter 2. All the way at the bottom. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, here we go. Verses 41. We'll start from 41. Acts chapter 2, start from 41. Says this, So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. This is the new covenant. This is beautiful. Listen, at the time Moses received the Ten Commandments, they committed sexual immorality. 3,000 people died on that day. In the time where the law of the Spirit is given in the new covenant, 3,000 people live. Isn't that beautiful? That's not the primary thing I'm focusing on, but that's beautiful. In the old covenant, the law brings death, folks. Grace brings life. 3,000 died, 3,000 lived. Hallelujah. Verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Continually devoted to these things. Daily. So there's one of the reasons we're not seeing miracles. We need to take personal responsibility. If we're not in the Word of God daily, we're already not being like the early church. Every day they're in the Word of God. Every day. Continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Right? Stephanie puts on my sermons all the time. Devoted to the apostles' teaching. I'm just teasing you guys. Verse 43. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Why? They devoted themselves to the word. That's where faith comes from. But look at this. See, people don't think that the miracles and the money are tied. And they are. Look at this. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Amen. Amen. Am I preaching to a church of believers? Are you seeing the connection? I see it. I see it. Jesus says, you won't be trusted with true riches if you don't handle earthly riches. We've got a church here handling earthly riches correctly. Says they don't even, they just had everything in common. They sold property and possessions, shared them with all. 
If you had the resources to help somebody, you just did it. That's the Christian church. And what's it say? Uh, many wonders and signs were taking place. And you think there's no tie to that? Oh, I guarantee you there's a t- You cannot serve God in money. There's absolutely a tie between earthly riches and true riches. And how you're behaving with earthly riches determines whether you are worthy of true riches. Hallelujah. Let's look at Acts chapter 4. Just a couple pages over if you're in a paper Bible. Acts chapter 4. Also at the end of this chapter. Oh yeah, here we go. Verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. Karl Marx got it wrong because he left out that this is done by your own free will, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why communism ends up evil. But when you look at Acts... They practiced biblical communism. What do I mean by that? I can just hear people a bit. What do you mean? They considered their property not to be their own, but shared it with everybody. But they didn't do so because of the boot of a soldier or the barrel of a gun. Do you understand? It wasn't through tyranny that this was being done. This was being done because the Christians were excited to share, knowing that God had provided for them And that God loved all the other people, including the poor, not just them. And that God had given them abundance so they could be generous and share with people. And they also knew that it was tied to God's power and miracles. And they're like, yeah, I want the power and miracles much more than I want the money. (laughs) Happy to share, happy to give. Right? So Marxism is no good. But the book of Acts, generosity, sharing, considering nothing to be your own. Listen. We're not there yet if you still think that what you have is yours. Every dollar, every car, every house, every land, every boat, every toy, every motorized fun vehicle, every, I don't know, a lot of people like to collect rifles, every rifle. I'm serious. Every china set and dining set. It's all God's. And they got it. And they walked in miracles. And they walked in real salvations. How do we know they were real salvations? Because they weren't Simon the Sorcerer's salvations. These weren't people trying to buy and sell and peddle the word of God. These were people that just realized, yeah, my possessions aren't mine. What does it say? And not one of them, not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. Not one of them. Wow, I read the book of Acts. I see, I see the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk and the dead raised. And I guess it's just not for today. That's the conclusion that so many people come to. I guess it's just because we could never admit if we're in the flesh, that it's me and my use of money. I can already see the co- just the angry comments on YouTube and TikTok to that idea. Because when you're in the flesh and you're not being generous, you got to come up with something that blames God. Oh, it's not God's will. It's to God's glory that people stay sick and die of cancer. Oh, it's God's glory. How wrong you are. God is glorified in healing the sick. In healing the sick. What did God say to Adam? Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. Why is the church not walking in the power that it once was? Because of you, Adam. This is the human condition. Because of you, God. And God says, because of you, Adam. 
Folks, repent. It is not God's fault. It is ours. We are unwilling to accept responsibility for our actions. And so we say God has ceased doing miracles instead of accepting responsibility for the fact that we have ceased obeying him with money, among other things. There are other hindrances I'm going to talk about. But money's a big one because Jesus said you cannot serve God and money. So it's, I'm starting there on purpose because as you can see, when people were getting saved, one of the first things they're doing in Acts chapter 2 is devoting themselves to the word and sharing their possessions. And I believe that's where every Christian should start. And if you haven't started there, restart and start there. Devotion to the word, because that's where faith is ignited from. Faith comes by hearing the word and devotion to generosity. Legacy housing should have a house in every state already. It should. So what is going on? Well, the same, we're running into the same issue that foster care itself is running into. There are more churches than there are orphans. If one family from every church would foster or adopt, there'd be no kids in foster care. There is a money problem. There is a heart problem in the Christian church. This church in the book of Acts, there'd be no kids in foster care. You want to know why? Watch. 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 Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all, for there was not a needy person among them. In other words, there wouldn't be an orphan. There wouldn't be someone without a home in this church. They didn't tolerate it. They didn't tolerate poverty. They didn't tolerate it. Their treasure in heaven was more valuable. They didn't consider their possessions their own. They looked at that boat that was worth $50,000 and they said, that is a house for a family in need. That's how they looked at things. It's true. That's how they looked. at. That's rent for a house for a large family in need so their kids don't go into foster care. That's what my boat is. That's how they looked at their boats. For there was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. This is basic Christianity. This isn't even advanced. This is not advanced theology at all. This was they got baptized they got into the word and they got to giving. And this is before the apostles were walking in miracles. The church started to walk in miracles eventually, but they started here. I think a lot of people are jumping to the miracles and they're skipping the money. And you cannot serve God in money. So you got to deal with the money issue so you can be trusted with the true riches. See, we're identifying problems now. The key is for you to repent. It's one thing for me to identify the problem. There's really only a few. You could just straight up ignore what I'm saying. You could get mad about it and try and refute it. Or you could accept the word planted in you and let it produce a harvest and start being generous and see what God does. Now, we talked about Barnabas last week. We'll read about him real quick. It says, now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Yeah. See, the Levites weren't even beyond this. The Levites, who already are considered the poor. You understand? Listen, okay, thanks be to God, I live a comfortable life. Why? Because people are generous to the Levite. I work for God. And the way he provides our needs is through the church. And that's how Levites lived. Noth everything they had was because of generosity and gifts. And even the Levite recognized, man, these nice things that God has provided are not more important than people, not more important than treasure in heaven. And so Barnabas sells. 
You have only a few chapters later that the Holy Spirit explicitly says to the apostles, set apart for me Barnabas for the work to which I have called him. And Barnabas and Paul go on to perform signs, wonders, and miracles for the kingdom together. And Barnabas's story starts at his heart getting right regarding money. It doesn't start at miracles. It starts at money. Barnabas's story starts at money. Zacchaeus's story starts at money. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. There are many stories that start at money. Why? Even Peter's life started at money. It says they left everything and followed him. He's a business owner. Understand what that means. He left money. He left even those boatloads of fish that he could have sold for money. He left money. Money matters. It affects your relationship with God. You cannot serve it and serve God. And stop trying to tell others and yourself and lie to yourself that you aren't serving money. Where's your generosity at? That proves whether you're serving money or not. Because if you're giving, you're not serving money. And I don't mean scraps. I mean generously. Because there's a lot of poverty in the earth. There's more than you can actually help. And so you do as much as you possibly can, not as little as you need to. I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because I know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same. The same forgiveness, the same healings, the same promises, which we're going to see, they're all still true. It has not ceased. He's the same God. The Spirit is given without limit. That same Holy Spirit is in us. He that's in you is greater than he who is in the world. The same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us, the Bible says. Yes. There is no difference on God's end. The difference is always Adam. It is always me. It is never God. It's always me. And the human problem is that we won't take responsibility and recognize that it's always me. Yes. Problem? Me. Not receiving something? Me. Now, what do the fancy preachers say? God. For his glory, he doesn't do what he promised. That's a lie from Satan. And I don't care how well respected the preacher is. It's a lie from Satan that it's to God's glory that he ignores his own word and doesn't do what he's promised to do. How dare we say that about God? You think you're being so humble but you're being arrogant in telling God that it's to his glory he doesn't do what's written. How dare we? God have mercy. You cannot serve God in money. It's the starting point. It's the starting point. Why do you think the disciples left everything? Why do you think, and many know this, the rich young ruler was being called to be a disciple and before he could be one, he had to give it all up and he wouldn't. Some of you are rich young rulers and you're refusing to give up and you still think you're a disciple and you're not. What does it say about the real disciples? This is the whole church. This isn't just one person. It says not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. In other words, if they owned it and then they saw need, they would sell it or they would give the item. That's it, period. That's how the church functioned. Acts chapter two, Acts chapter four. And they had miracles. I don't know. Maybe they're the blueprint for the whole church. What do you think about that idea? What do you think about Acts being our example? Not the TV preachers. Not even the reformers 500 years ago. Not even all the councils that the church has had. What if the church in the book of Acts is our example? What if they are our example? Example of how we are to behave today. What if that's what they are? I submit to you that they are. They're the only ones that made it into the actual writings of Scripture. The church down the street didn't. 
The church 500 years ago didn't. The church 1,000 years ago didn't. The only ones who made it into Scripture as the example that this is how things ought to be is the church in the book of Acts. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm serious. Absolutely. Even Corinth had a lot wrong. Most of the letters are corrections. Acts Church, right here at the very beginning, they're just doing it right. Can we do it right again? Yes, we can. Right. We can, but we have to come to the exact same place that no one's going to claim that anything they have is theirs anymore. We have to get there. We have to get there. Don't let the devil lie to you. Well, some poor people, you can't give them money. If you notice in the Bible, they would lay the money at the apostles' feet. The apostles would pay for things that people needed. It's true. If somebody's addicted, they need deliverance. You don't necessarily want to give them money, but you can give them things needful. You can pay a bill. You can buy them groceries. You can give them a ride. You can buy them shoes. You're just making excuses. There would be no kids in foster care in the Acts Church. There would be no homeless in the streets of wherever the Acts Church was, which would be Jerusalem. Do you understand? None of that. The fact that that even exists with this many churches in the United States, it is us, not God. How many times? Do we need to hear that from the Holy Spirit? It is us, not God. No. Have mercy on the church, Lord. Please wake us up. Please, all of us, please wake us up. All things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. It's what they all did. You cannot point to the rich young ruler and go, oh no, it's just a special story for one guy. No. Acts chapter 4, they all did not consider their possessions theirs. They sold whatever they need to, whenever they needed to, to give to whoever God said to. And they had miracles. Hence the title of the sermon, God, Money, and Miracles. They had miracles because they did the right thing with the money. If you're receiving something, say amen. 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 Let's go to Isaiah 53. See, they believed. They, so they didn't have the New Testament scriptures. You understand? They only had the Old Testament still. Which the Old Testament is sufficient to understand the Messiah. Sufficient. If we had no New Testament the Old Testament is sufficient to know the Messiah. I'm serious. I had a, a Jewish gentleman that I wrote a letter to because he said, well, he didn't accept the Gospels and all of that. So I, I preached the Gospel to him using only the Old Testament. Amen. A ton of passages and prophecies all about the Son. All about the Lord said unto my Lord, as David said. Yes. All, about, all about that. All about how in the Psalms it shows exactly what would happen at the crucifixion and Jesus fulfilled exactly those things according to historical record, not even just in the Bible, but also Roman and Jewish historical record. Jesus is here in the Old Testament. Don't be afraid of the Old Testament, okay? Just learn how to rightly divide the word. There's different ages. There's the Edenic age. There's the Noahide age. There's the Mosaic age. There's the New Covenant age. There's different, different times, Okay. It's okay. You can, you, the Holy Spirit can teach you that. Don't be afraid of the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. All right, so Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus, all about the Messiah. But we're going to read 4 through 6. It says, Surely our griefs he himself bore. It's bad. If you read the, uh, what is it, the Christian Jewish Bible or the contemporary Jewish Bible? CJB. Okay, I trust them more with the, with the Hebrew yep. than the Gentiles. Gentiles are pr usually probably better at Greek, and then the Jewish Christians are usually better at the Old Testament Hebrew. Okay, surely our griefs he himself bore. A lot of translations use this word griefs. Okay, the word is holy or holy. It means sickness, only sickness. It's only ever sickness. If you look at all of the other verses that use this, sickness, 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 sickness. Are you looking over here? Sickness, 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 sickness. And then we get to Jesus bearing our sicknesses. 
And we're so afraid of the implications of that. We're fine telling people he bore our sins. But if we tell them he bore our sicknesses and people aren't getting healed, we have to ask this big why question. And then we've got to take responsibility. And then we've got to start looking at our bank accounts. It's all related. Oh, it's all, it's all related. Why would a translator say griefs when it's not griefs? It's sickness. Why would a translator do that? Why would he handle the word of God improperly? Because of the implications. If Jesus bore sickness just like he did sin, if we're going to preach forgiveness of sin, then we have to preach healing of sickness. And then there's going to be people not healed in the church. And we're going to have to answer that question. And we're so afraid of answering that question because we'd rather just say God's glory is why instead of us. Jesus always put it on us. People are so offended when we talk about faith and us having little faith. What would Jesus say to the disciples when they failed to do things? They failed to heal in Matthew. What did he say? Because you have so little faith. When Peter fell into the water, what did he say? Why did you doubt? Why did you have a little faith? When he couldn't heal anybody in his hometown, what does it say? Because of their lack of faith. We've got to stop being offended by personal responsibility. If faith is how we're going to receive from God, stop trying to find ways out of it. You'll never receive from God except the word of the Lord when he says ye of little faith. Now, how does faith grow? Well, we stop translating sickness into griefs and we translate it as sickness and we believe what's written. Do you understand? How's faith going to grow? It's going to grow when you believe what's written. What do we say earlier that came from the Holy Spirit? We have got to stop telling God that it's for his glory that he doesn't do what's written. No, it's us. We're translating words into griefs that mean sickness. And then we're not getting healed because we believe false doctrines regarding healing. Surely our sicknesses he himself bore and our not sorrows. It can be emotional technically, but its first meaning is physical. Do you see? I'm not lying to you. Its first primary meaning is physical pain. Of course, he does bear emotional pain too. cast your cares on him for he cares for you. The Bible says, of course, of course. But we're ignoring the physical side. We'll deal with spiritual. We'll even deal with emotional. We really don't do well right now in this current generation of dealing with physical ailments. We can counsel emotional ailments pretty effectively. I actually think the church does a decent job at that. And we're certainly preaching spiritual truths about forgiveness of sin. But we are not teaching that Jesus bore physical sickness and physical pain on the cross. And this is where we get the doctrine that Jesus bore our sins. It's Isaiah 53. So that means that the same weight that Jesus bearing our sins bears in our doctrine, him bearing our sickness must bear equal weight. What do I mean by that? We must believe fully in healing of the body as much as we do forgiveness of sin. Because it would be wrong to believe fully in in healing of the body and to not believe forgiveness of sin, just as it is wrong to believe in forgiveness of sin and not believe healing of the body. Surely our sicknesses he himself bore and our pains he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. There's him bearing our sins. If we're going to preach verse 5, we must preach verse 4. And if healing isn't happening, we need to go to God and say, God, what's wrong with me? Not what's wrong with you, because your word's true. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Fully, totally, mind, body, spirit. Total healing. Total healing. This is the gospel. The full gospel is not an evil phrase. The full gospel means that you believe he bore both the physical, emotional and spiritual problems of humanity all on the cross. That he bore sickness itself, that he bore pain itself, that he bore sin itself, that he bore death itself. Why is death, pain and sickness here? Sin. Sin. 
Jesus bore all sin and the effects of sin. The curse of the law, he bore it. The curse in Deuteronomy. It's Jesus. God says, he says, if you don't obey my commandments, you will have all the illnesses written in this book and even those not written in the book. Pretty scary stuff. All the things that came on the Egyptians and more, even things you've never heard of. You'll have lingering illnesses. You'll have chronic illnesses. You have all these things from sin is his point. And we, thanks be to God, have the promise that Jesus bore that curse on the cross for us. That's what Galatians says, that he became a curse for us. How? Because he bore our sicknesses. Man, just ignore that word griefs. Get a Bible translation that translates it correctly. I know the CJB does. Surely our sicknesses he himself bore and our pain he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. In other words, we thought he was being punished by God. The Jews thought he was being punished by God because he did something wrong. No, we did something wrong. It's always somebody else's fault. Even They even looked at Jesus and they're like, yep, it's his fault. Nope. My fault. Adam's fault. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. We transgressed the law. We did evil things. He bore both of those. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This is the good news of the gospel. That Jesus has bore all iniquity and all effects of iniquity, including sickness, pain, and death itself. If you are promised forgiveness of sin and you are promised resurrection, why are you ignoring the middle road between those two things? If the end result of sin is death and you're promised forgiveness and you are promised resurrection, it makes logical sense that you're promised healing of the body. Because that's the in-between, isn't it? Sin, sick, die. And you're teaching forgiveness of sin and resurrecting, but you're not teaching healing. And you're saying it's for the glory of God that God doesn't keep his word, even though Jesus bore all sicknesses. To be consistent in your theology, you must teach that Jesus didn't bear all sins. If he didn't bear all sicknesses, he didn't bear all sins. And now you're a liar. You already were a liar, but now you're clearly a liar. Speaking for the Antichrist. All of it, for all of us, on Jesus. Yes. Period. Yes. If you're receiving something, say amen. 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 Promise I'm not mad at you. I'm pleading with you. With all of us. My own self. Pleading with you to believe what's written. To no longer deny what's written. Go to Matthew chapter 8. I want you to see in the Gospels that this is confirmed, that I'm not making this up. Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses 16 and 17. Jesus has done several healings here, according to your faith, according to your faith. He's done several healings. And then here's what verses 16 and 17 say. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. His word heals. His word heals. His word heals. Hear his word and be healed. Hear and be healed. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what it teaches. Psalm 107 says that he sent forth his word and healed them. His word heals. Jesus speaks a word and heals. You are reading the word. It heals. Verse 17. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Is it crazy that they, they translate it correctly in the Greek and not in the Hebrew? Most Bibles are like this. In the Greek, they just can't escape the fact that the Greek word is diseases. In Hebrew, they tried to explain it away, even though it's sickness, sickness, sickness. I showed you, right? It's like it always translates as sickness. 
Well, it's the same in the Greek. And for some reason, the Greek translators were like, okay, I guess we have to say it because there's nothing else that we could change this to. Hopefully they don't go read Isaiah 53. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Folks, we just read Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8, 17 is quoting Isaiah 53, 4, what we just read. And it's quoting it correctly. Infirmities and diseases, pains and diseases. Weaknesses, pain and disease. And it says it right after he was healing all. Notice it says he gave his word and then he healed all. God is not a respecter of persons. All who believe can be healed and will be healed and are healed. The, the work of the cross actually is already done. By his stripes we were healed. It's past tense. So our duty is now to believe that the work has been done regardless of what we're seeing. Well, preacher, why isn't everybody healed? For the same reason, not everybody is saved. Did Jesus bear all sins? Well, you've theologically explained that one away, haven't you? In some way, you've come to terms with that fact. And you've probably concluded, rightfully, that it's not that Jesus isn't powerful enough to save, or that it's not Jesus' will to save, or that it's to God's glory that people perish. You've concluded that it's the person's fault for not believing because the work has already been done. But when it comes to disease because it's something we can see more readily than sin, we have a hard time accepting that it's the exact same conclusion. The problem is with us. Us. People are not saved. People are not healed. They're not forgiven. They're not healed. Us is the problem. It is written, Jesus bore it all. If we're not experiencing what's written, it's a ye of little faith situation. And we have got to get over that hurdle. Because Jesus said it to the disciples, he's never going to say it to you. Who are you that Jesus would never say to you, you of little faith, if he said it to Peter? Who are you? How arrogant are we? We really are. Oh, I have a thorn in my flesh. First off, Sickness is never listed in Paul's That's right. thorn That's right. issue. That's right. Did Paul ever become sick? Yeah, he did, actually. In the writings, he got sick. We all can get sick. Yep. Paul sinned like we do. He could have committed a sin, opened the door to sickness, and then repented and been healed. He, he doesn't live in sickness. And that thorn, that continual thorn, sickness is never listed. But who are you to think that you're worthy of Paul's thorn? Give me a break. Do you realize he said that it was because he had surpassingly great knowledge more than anybody else for a season, which makes sense. He was writing a lot of the New Testament scripture. So God gave him a thorn. What was the thorn? Persecution and hardship, shipwrecks. You know, he's bit by a snake on Malta, but the poison didn't do anything to him. The snake bite is the thorn, the devil attacking, but God would give him victory. The shipwreck is the thorn, the devil attacking, but God gave him victory, floated over to the island. Do you understand? Yes. You're not worthy of Paul's thorn. Stop thinking you are. I hope one day you would be. You're not right now. Until you're being shipwrecked three times and beaten with rods. And imprisoned regularly. You're not in the same status as Paul. Who are you? The arrogance in the church is astounding. You know how Abraham talked about himself to God? I am nothing but dust and ash. You all think you're Apostle Paul. And Abraham goes, I'm dirt. God, please listen to my words. I'm the Apostle Paul and I have a thorn in my flesh. Abraham, I am dirt before you. Rebuke that spirit of pride. Receive that correction and stop being so prideful. Humble yourself before the living God and he will exalt you. 
Did Jesus bear the curse? You bet he did. You betcha. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For us. That's what Isaiah 53 is. I'm bearing it for you. You deserve it, but it came on me. Becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now you can fix your faith on this. The curse was bore by Jesus. If you see the curse in your life, I'm not saying that it can't occur. It can. It can't. It does occur. When we walk in sin, it does. But when you've repented of your sins and that curse tries to linger, now's the time for faith. Okay, I'm serious. Forgiveness is real. So when you are forgiven after confession, which the Bible says you are, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't linger on in that shame. You recognize there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And you fix your faith on the fact that that curse that is on you or on your loved one or on someone you know is now bore by Jesus Christ. And now we have the authority to attack it. Yeah. Because it's the devil's work unlawfully being done. In a, at one point, it might be lawful. But when you're forgiven, it's no longer lawful. And that's why you can take authority. That's why Jesus said, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the devil. Nothing shall harm you. Luke 8. Why? Because I bore the curse for you. You no longer have to walk in that curse of the law. Didn't he show that? Everyone who believed was healed. Everyone. Everyone who believed. Everyone. The only people not healed were people who didn't believe. Everyone else was believed. Entire crowds, entire cities, everyone. Goes to his hometown, no faith. Disciples failed to heal. In Matthew, he says, lack faith. So money and faith. We've addressed these two topics so far. Money requires faith. Not giving shows you and everyone else you don't really have faith because he's going to provide. So no wonder we're not experiencing miracles because we're over here not believing that God's going to provide if I give away my money. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus hung on the tree for us so we don't have to walk in the curse. If you're receiving something, say amen. Amen, I'm receiving it. All right. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 18. Yeah, verses 18 through 20. But as God is faithful, everybody say God is faithful. God is faithful to his word. Just know this. When we're faithless, he's faithful. It's not him. It's not to his glory that he does not do what he promised. He is faithful. And that's why they start there. God is faithful. Our word to you is not yes and no. Okay? So a promise or a word from God is not yes and no. Yes for you, no for you. Yes for you, no for you. He bore all sin. He bore all sickness. Not yes and no. This is what they're addressing. God is faithful. The message is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who is preached among you by us, by me and Sy Salvanius and Timothy, was not yes and no, but it is yes in him. Yeah. For as many... It needs to be highlighted. Yeah. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Here's God's glory. Yes. Amen. I found it. It is written that God's glory comes when we believe by saying amen that the promises are yes. yes. That's God's glory. I know. It's God's glory that he's faithful to what is written. Do you understand? It's to God's glory that he's faithful to the promises and the promises through Christ are yes, they're not yes and no. I'll heal this cancer, baby, and not this one. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that he has bore sickness and pain for all. 
paying the sailors. It is not yes and no. It's yes. God is faithful and it's to his glory. I hear so much about how it's to God's glory, but yet I see it written that a yes to the promises is to his glory. He's glorified when we believe that the answer is yes. So Adam, since the ground is cursed because of you and all the promises are yes, and Jesus is bore all sin and sickness, and some are not saved and some are not healed. Why? We started at money. That's a real big hindrance. Unbelief. That's a big hindrance. We're going to look at that a little bit more. Unforgiveness. It's another big one. And unrepentant sin. Now, if you'd like, I mean, we can all just go home. But if you'd like, I can show you each hindrance in the Bible so that you can overcome each one. I'm with that. So that we can receive healing. Yes. Yes, Heather, did God heal you? Yes, he did. He did. Were there hindrances in your life? Absolutely. And by hearing the word, so you were able to believe and overcome those hindrances. So let's look at that. Let's turn to Mark 11. Mark 11 is a very famous faith passage. If you've ever heard full gospel preachers, you know they will preach Mark 11. But there's a part of Mark 11 that I don't hear preached enough. This is true. That's necessary. Kind of like how the money is tied to miracles thing. Mark 11, 24 through 26. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received him and they will be granted to you. You, could, you should meditate on Mark 11. Just go over this over and over again. All things for which you pray and ask. All, all means all in the Greek, just so you know. I, 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 I just get tired of people being like, well, all means maybe and sometimes. Nope, all means all. All things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Believe that you have received them. That's before you see them. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It's the conviction that is done before you see it. And hope means confidently expecting it. So faith is confidently expecting that it's done before you see it. That's Hebrews 11, properly translated. Believe that you have received them. He already bore my sin and sickness. See, really, when you're confessing sin, you're just reaccessing the fact that he's bore it for you. You're confessing it humbly before God. But thanks be to God, Christ already bore it. That's why you can receive forgiveness for it. It's already been done. Praise God. It's automatic. God is faithful and just. You're forgiven. Boom. You repented. You're forgiven. Boom. Well, it's the same for praying for healing. It's already done. It's done. Jesus bore it on the cross. Our duty is to believe that. And I'm not even saying that that's easy. What I'm saying is we have to learn from the disciples. The disciples said to Jesus, increase our faith. They recognized their faith was lacking. They said, increase our faith. And so he spoke his word unto them because faith comes by hearing. See, the early church, they weren't just giving their money. Big part of what we're talking about. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Devotion. Is there a devotion to God's word? Because that's where faith comes from and ignites and grows. God's word. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Everybody say forgive. Forgive. Hindrance. Hindrance. When you stand praying, forgive means that if you don't forgive, when you stand praying, nothing's going to happen. Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. It's not to God's glory for him to fail to keep his word. In fact, he never fails to keep it. We fail to believe it. And he will not grant it to you until you believe it. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. 
Sounds to me like Jesus wants us to receive what we pray for based on those first couple of verses. And then he identifies the big problem to receiving it because he knows. He also knows that we fake forgive. What's fake forgiveness? Therapists even teach fake forgiveness. So watch out. It's like my therapist told me how to forgive. Watch out. The Bible teaches us how to forgive. The Bible says to forgive as God forgave you. Okay. So let's do a test. Your version of forgiveness is, I forgive you. Please don't speak to me or contact me. Please stay away from me. I got a restraining order against you. I don't want to speak to you ever. It's not, I want to minister to you and see you saved. It's please leave me alone. I forgive you. Please leave me alone. Okay, right. And, and, hey, and you might be a victim and they're the perpetrator. I get that. Okay, Jesus is a victim of murder. Okay, how does Jesus forgive as a victim of murder? As far as I can tell, all of us with bitterness, we're all still alive, so no one's murdered us. And I'd say murder is probably the worst thing you could do to somebody else. There are really heinous things people can do to others. Murder is the end of life. Pretty bad. So Jesus receives murder. All right, so as an example of one who has received murder, he also shows us forgiveness. And how does he forgive? Well, thanks be to God, he doesn't say, hey, I forgive you, please don't ever speak to me again. I have a restraining order against you. You're not welcome in heaven, but you're forgiven. Let this convict you. How does Jesus forgive? Beloved, I forgive you. And I'm going to treat you like you never did what you did. And I'm going to be your friend. And more than that, my father's going to adopt you. God adopts the ones who murdered his son. It's not supposed to make sense. It's meant to be amazing. So the Bible says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. What does that mean? It means that forgiveness is reconciliation. Yeah, there's dangerous people you have to forgive. Yep. All of us who murdered Jesus, that's pretty dangerous people. I'm a pretty dangerous person since I'm capable of killing God's son. Okay, so dangerous people need forgiveness. How do we, how do we, how do, we do this? Well, you can communicate with people while still being safe. You can communicate in groups. That's one way to be safe. You can write letters. You can do phone calls. You can forgive and have relationship and be safe. But safety cannot be the primary determining factor on whether we obey God or not. Because a lot of people died as martyrs for obeying God. So ultimately, it's just obey God. Right, I think in the general it's be safe. But ultimately, if it's for God's glory, for you to minister to those who are going to harm you, then you minister to those who are going to harm you. I know that's wild. The Bible's wild, guys. Peter's killed. Paul's killed. They're all killed. James, the brother of Jesus, beheaded. You know, James wasn't even a Christian until after the resurrection. He gets beheaded shortly after that. He gets so on fire for Jesus. He doubted that Jesus was Lord because he was his brother. So he's like, this is a lot of nonsense. After the resurrection, James believed. If you study Christian history, he was one of the heads of the Jerusalem church right at the beginning with Peter, and he's beheaded for it by Rome. So yeah, forgiveness is serious stuff. Mercy is serious stuff. That's why we trust God. Now, here's the deal. Nobody could harm any of the disciples until it was time anyway. So you trust God. See, because what God sees is, what if that murderer repents? That's what he sees. What if that, you know, abuser repents? That's what he sees. Now, for safety, I'm serious. Write them a letter. Call them on the phone. If they're in prison, you're safe to visit them at prison. They can't touch you. They're behind glass or they're on the video chats. You guys know if you've gone to visit somebody in prison. God says reconcile because he reconciled with us. And we're murderers. I think the best way that you can get to the place that you can forgive people who have really harmed you is to recognize you really harmed Jesus. Mm. His scars are because I drove those nails in. Those scars are my work. 
You understand? We understand. So when Jesus is praying, he's teaching us about prayer, and he says forgive, it carries a lot of weight. So why aren't we seeing miracles? There's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of greed. We've addressed that. There's a lot of bitterness. We've got to release people. And I really don't say this judgmentally at all. I think, I think forgiveness is the cross. I think it's really hard. I don't think forgiveness is an easy thing. I see the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what forgiveness is. It's very hard. This is, I am not, this is not cakewalk. Raising the dead is not a cakewalk. I get this. You've got so many hurdles. You've got the greed hurdle. You've got unforgiveness. And we just got started. And so no wonder people just go, oh, it's to God's glory that this person stays sick. Because who wants to jump this obstacle course? But the truth is, this obstacle course, you gain Christ and every promise. See, what does he say? If you don't forgive others, you won't be forgiven. That means, that means you apostate if you die with bitterness in your heart. You understand? You can get saved while there's still some bitterness. But you will forfeit your salvation if you die with bitterness. You've got to release this stuff. There is no way that God is letting someone in who can't forgive when he's shown us such great forgiveness. That's the parable of the unmerciful servant. So many people are like, once saved, always saved. Have you read the unmerciful servant? What happens? He's forgiven of all debt, isn't he? All of his debts are forgiven. He has this huge debt against the king and they're all forgiven. That's salvation. It is. And then he goes and another servant owes him a debt, which would be somebody sinning against you. And it's a much smaller debt than the debt owed to the king that was forgiven. And it says he chokes the man and throws him in prison. He presses charges. Yes, he does press charges. And he throws him in prison. <laughs> Sometimes the state will automatically press charges. Let the state do its job. Do you understand? The state, the state does do its job. The scriptures say in Romans 13 that they bear the sword, not you. They bear the sword. Now, if you're a police officer or what have you and you're a Christian, you know it's not personal when you're exacting judgment. You don't even know the person. You're just addressing actions. But when it is personal, folks, as Christians, it's for the state to deal with. We don't choke and throw people in prison because that's what the unmerciful servant did. Do you understand? So he does that. The king hears about it. The king calls him back in. This is in Matthew 18. The king calls him back in. He says, you wicked servant. He went from forgiven servant to wicked servant. What's Ezekiel say? Ezekiel 18. Says that if there's a righteous man who's known for his righteousness and does righteous deeds, starts to do evil. None of his righteous works will be remembered. He will be punished for the wickedness and treated as a wicked man. Doesn't matter if he lived 50 years of righteousness. If he started to live wicked at the end, he's counted as wicked. That's what happens with this man in this story is the Ezekiel warning. He is forgiven and he's made righteous and then he lives wickedly and he calls him in and he calls him, you wicked servant. He goes from forgiven to wicked. You wicked servant, shouldn't you have forgiven your fellow servant just as I forgave you? That's what he asked him. And then it says in anger, he handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he paid back all he owed, which if you know the sin debt is unpayable, which is why hell is destruction by fire. You don't live. It's destruction. And Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from your heart. I want to see miracles. I really, I mean that sincerely. God loves everybody. His promises are yes. So if you wonder why I'm being so firm, it's because these hindrances are deadly. You will apostate if you don't forgive people. Should I preach that lightly? Or should I be dead serious with you? We need to take this as serious as it is. We need to be somber before God and recognize there are things to be joyful about. Yes and amen. Jesus bore the promises. That's where we were. Now we're talking about hindrances and we need to be somber. And recognize that this is serious business. 
And no wonder the preachers only want to read verse 24. Hey, if, brother, if you just believe that you've received it, it'll be granted you. That's great. That's great. Can we just stop there? No, Jesus didn't stop there. He talked about unforgiveness right after. So what's the hindrances so far? Well, we've got money, being greedy, big hindrance. We've got lack of faith, which we are going to talk about next a little bit more. We've got this unforgiveness. That, see, that one's a little different. I literally believe that you're damned if you don't forgive your neighbors. I mean, I, that's where I'm at. I, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. And I read the parable of the unmerciful servant who's forgiven of all things, and then all things are put back on him. I just take that as, okay, you're damned if you die with bitterness. So you better release it. No one who's forgiven by Jesus is going to be allowed to hold unforgiveness in the kingdom of heaven. That's just period. Okay, so salvation is a free gift. And now that you have it, let's not forfeit it by living wickedly. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Unbelief, unbelief, which we did talk about some, but we need to see it written so that we understand. James 1, verses 6 and 7, talking about asking for wisdom, but this is true asking for anything. Right. Mark 11 says that you have to believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Verse six, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. Everybody say any doubting. Any doubting. All right. So any amount of doubt becomes a hindrance. We shouldn't sit around and be ashamed of these things. We need to identify problems. Right. What do doctors do? A good doctor, a good doctor. Do they just throw pills? Or just some of them do. But what does a good doctor do? They look for the problem. For the right. Think of a good surgeon. He doesn't cut you open to hurt you, does he? No. no. And I'm not trying to hurt you, and I mean that. He cuts you open because it's necessary to get at what's broken and identify the problem and start to put it back together. Right? But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That's a rough warning. That, that the person who doubts can't expect to receive anything. So we've read in the same sermon, we've read that all the promises are yes. Yes. And that when we believe for them, they're all yes. And it's to the glory of God that we receive them. That's what's taught in the Bible. Didn't we read it? We read it, right? I'm not making it up. Okay. Now we're reading that that same person, all the promises are yes to, it's impossible for them to receive those promises if they're doubting God. If they're saying things like it's to God's glory, that so-and-so stays sick, instead of it's to God's glory to do what's written and promised, then they're a doubter and it's why they're not receiving. Again, how are we going to fix things? We have to identify problems. I'm not even saying I've got it all figured out or I'm, you know, is my shadow healing people as I walk by? No, but I trust that the written word is true. Amen. I trust that it's true. I'm, I'm not discouraged. Peter failed to heal in Matthew 17. He failed to heal the boy. You remember, it was a child. If there's anybody we should be motivated to heal, it's a child. Yes. And he failed. He failed. In fact, all 12 of them failed. In fact, all the other ones with them failed. They all failed to heal this boy. They didn't even ask Jesus why in Matthew 17. They didn't even ask him. I am... I'm sure that they came to the same conclusion that you hear out of so many Christian mouths today. Must not be God's will in this case. Some mystery. And then Jesus, oh, Jesus comes along. Father comes to him and he goes, hey, your disciples couldn't heal him. And he says, you wicked and perverse generation. You unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long will I put up with you? He's so tired of his own disciples not believing. Coming up with doctrines like, must not be the will of God. And then he says, bring the boy here to me. And he brings the boy and he comes. 
commands that spirit of infirmity out of the boy and the boy's healed. Disciples failed, Jesus didn't. That should give you hope. Disciples failed, Jesus didn't. Jesus' will was not necessarily what man said Jesus' will was. And it's proven by what actually happened there. And then they go and ask Jesus, well, why couldn't we drive it out? Finally, they ask him. See, that's what's going to start happening when all these people start to get healed again. All that falsehood doctrine. Uh, Why did that work and it didn't work when we did it? We should ask that question if we're ever going to see it. You know what he says? Brace yourselves, church, because you have so little faith. I know. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. So long as you sit around wondering whether it's God's will or not. 50 50, 60 40, doesn't really matter. You won't receive it. This is 100% woman with the issue of blood. If I just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. This is 100% Roman centurion. Just say the word and my servant is healed. And folks, if the disciples failed to heal, but then later Peter raised the dead. Remember, Tabitha died. And he raised her from the dead. Same guy. There's the hope. See, it's not all bad news. There's hope in the word of God. Oh, that us weak men, that we can start to believe. And we can start to walk in the promises. See, Peter's an example for us in so many ways. He failed in so many ways, and he had victory in so many ways. We get both with Peter. Denies Jesus, even knowing him, three times, and then dies on a cross for him. Fails to heal this little child who needed healing and then raises the dead. Amen. Take courage Amen. in that truth that God can take a person who's failing to heal right now and make them raise the dead. See, that's faith in God. Right, right, right. I don't have faith in Peter or myself. I have faith in God that he can take this failure and make me victorious. Yes. Do you understand? Yes. I understand, That I can go from denying Jesus to dying for Jesus. That I can go from failing to heal to raising the dead. Just like Peter. That's the hope that's in you. That means that those promises really are yes. And it really is us. It's not God. And what what hope do we have if, if God really did say no? Like, no, I won't heal them. We have no hope. That's not the message. So I know that this is a somber understanding, but also take hope and joy in the fact that God isn't against us and isn't saying no. He is not saying no. He is saying yes. What you're praying and believing for that's promised in the Bible, which includes healing, he is saying yes. He is saying yes. All the promises are yes. And our amen brings the glory of God. And don't be discouraged by time periods. Woman with the issue of blood was sick for a long time. She also, after she started believing, still had to make this journey to Jesus. She, she had to, it was a lot of work. And she was healed. It's an important story. Abraham waited 20 years for Isaac from the time he received the promise. Time does not dictate whether it's true or not. Time is also a test. If you only believe God, if he'll do it instantaneously, do you really believe him? No, Abraham was just so fixated on the fact that it was true. He just believed it. It didn't really matter. Year 10, doesn't matter. Year 15, doesn't matter. Year 20, doesn't matter. He was totally confident that God was going to do it. Totally confident. Confident expectation. Okay, so the promise is healing. By his stripes, we were healed. What we need to do is be like our father Abraham and confidently expect that that's true. And time is not a factor. Does God do instant healing? Yeah. Do I believe that's his perfect will? Yeah, I do. I do believe instant healing. Jesus would instant heal. I believe that. But I also believe that Jesus worked with people who weren't quite there yet. There was a man who was blind. When he first laid hands and prayed for him, he then opened his eyes and it says he saw men as trees. Do you remember the story? In other words, he saw, but it was blurry. Great improvement. Don't give up. Jesus is... 
Jesus is still ready and willing to heal. He's working with the man where he's at. Lays hands on him again. Jesus Christ. Do you think that it's Jesus' lack of power no that he had to lay hands on him twice? No way. No. Sheesh. It was the man, wasn't it? That's what we're learning. It was the man. So where the man's faith was, thus he received that far. So he celebrated the progress instead of going, oh, I think this is as far as God will take me. He celebrated the progress. Let's pray again. Oh, there's power. And let's pray again, church. Let's pray again, church. We prayed 10 times. Let's pray again, church. We've been praying for years. Let's pray again, church. Jesus prayed again, church. We should pray again, church. Lay hands again, church. If Jesus did it more than once, you should do it, church. Pray again, church. Keep praying until you see it. If Jesus prayed again, we should pray again. Hallelujah. God is faithful. I want to give you a little encouragement because I know Matthew 17 story is pretty rough. But let's see how he ends it, right? Matthew 17, 19, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? That's where we're at. I mean, just in general, the church. Why aren't we driving them out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. That is offensive. And it's true. And it's a surgeon cutting you open to fix your heart. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. He doesn't hate us. Does Jesus hate the disciples? No. No. Is he trying to crush them? No. No. Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you. Okay, so you're believing one thing. Let me tell you what's the truth. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. In other words, it's not going to take that much. That's actually an encouragement, not a discouragement. Mustard seeds are tiny. He said, listen, if you just, just believe me enough. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. All right. So your mind is saying one thing. Jesus is saying nothing is impossible for one who believes. So our mind and the disciples mind is saying, well, it must not be God's will because when we prayed, it didn't happen. But Jesus is saying nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible for you. Pray again. Pray again. Nothing is impossible for you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Okay. So adding to faith, he's saying prayer. Pray again. Prayer. Prayer. Pray again. Not one-time prayers. Lifetime prayers, folks. God, I thank you that Sarah is going to bear the child for me. I know that even though she hasn't yet, that your word is true and that I will have a son by Sarah. Pray for 20 years. Pray. Pray. Believe for instant. Pray until it instantly happens. Do you understand? Believe for instant. That is what God does when he heals people. Instant and pray all the way up to the instant. Do you understand? Prayer and fasting. Fasting is real. It's a real tool. Do you know what fasting does? Fasting actually addresses the greed issue. Isaiah talks about true fasting and says that while not eating, you're also giving to the poor. It's not just about not eating. It's about giving to the poor at the same. It literally addresses the greed issue. People don't think fasting has anything to do with money. Oh, boy. When you cannot serve God in money, lots of things are tied to money, even fasting. So when you're fasting, you're giving, you're not eating food. What does not eating food do for you? Well, giving and not eating food do the same thing. By not eating food, you are telling your body no, which puts you more in the spirit realm than in the fleshly realm. Then by giving, you're also telling your body no, because your body would like to buy more things. So you are twofold for how long you fast, telling your body no, and it's powerful. The body has more power over you than you think. When you fast, you start to see it, right? Hangry is a word for a reason. The body has a lot of power over people. How do we get out of it having power? Fasting. So how do you get into that spirit realm? You start giving and you stop eating. Hmm. I'm serious. It works. I've done it. 
And then you pray. And you pray. And you keep praying. You pray even when the fast is over. You pray. Daniel fasted for weeks and prayed the whole time. And then his prayer was answered. This kind comes out by prayer and fasting. Hey, is it a tougher sickness? Is it paralyzation? Is it demonic possession? He says, forgive. He says, fast. He says, pray. He says, believe what's written. All of it. Like I said, I didn't say it was easy. I'm just saying it's true. And it's easy for him. And if we'll believe him, it's easy for him. It's instantaneous for him. Because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, not what the other people said, not what you thought. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing. Nothing is impossible for you. What else do you need from Jesus? We just got to meditate on that. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. Nothing is impossible. God's will is to do the impossible for you. Because what's impossible for man is possible for God. And that's why nothing is impossible for those who believe God. Praise God. Are you receiving something? Unrepentant sin. Unrepentant sin. This is another big hindrance. See, no wonder. This sermon takes a while to get through, doesn't it? To tell people their hindrances to healing. So what's easier? It's for the glory of God. I mean, it's just easier. You wonder why the preachers preach that. It's just easier to preach. It doesn't take as much rightly dividing the word. It doesn't take as much study. It puts the responsibility off of you. It looks holier than thou. But it's a demonic doctrine. James 5.16 Uh, well, actually, verse 14. Start from 14. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Notice the tie between sin and sickness. Didn't we see that in Isaiah 53? He bore sin and sickness. It's here in James 5. Sin and sickness are tied. They will be forgiven. The promise is healing and forgiveness, folks. It's not maybe, it's yes. They will be. It doesn't say for some, it says they, it's all of us. Verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was. Didn't Elijah run from Jezebel? Didn't he have weaknesses? And yet mighty miracles were wrought through him. Wow. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly. See, when he got earnest with God, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. I think I've prayed maybe twice over the weather and it worked for like an hour. <laughs> Elijah prayed and it didn't rain for three years, six months. I, you think I'm joking? I'm not joking. There was a storm coming to a pool we were at. <laughs> I literally, <laughs> you just think I'm nuts. I was like, I'm going to see sunlight in Jesus name. Those clouds are going to split. Did that, is that what the weather said? No, it said raining for the rest of the day. I kid you not, sunlight came through the clouds and they split. I don't know if it was a half hour or what. <laughs> Elijah could pray for that stuff and it lasts for three and a half years. <laughs> That's where God wants us to be. People read and they go, oh yeah, when Jesus says like, you know, you'll throw a mountain into the sea. Like it's spiritual, it's your spiritual mountains. No, no, no. Elijah made physical rain start and stop. Joshua prayed and the sun stopped. Jesus means it when he says throwing mountains into the ocean. He made the mountains by his word. He's like, hey, I've given you some of my power. And that is by faith, you can throw them into the ocean. He didn't say you can create the earth like he can. He just said you can throw what I've made into the ocean. I'm telling you, before Jesus comes back, somebody's going to do it. Might as well be you. 
Let's believe. Verse 18, then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Now, why, after talking about sickness, would he say verses 19 and 20? My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, what's, what truth is he even talking about right now? He's talking about healing, isn't he? That's the truth he's talking about straying from. If any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Folks, it's serious business whether we believe God or not. And he's saying, help people to come to faith in this stuff. John 5, 14. We're almost done. You guys have done very well. And we're going to pray afterwards. Anyone who wants prayer will pray after. And we'll keep praying. We'll keep praying. James 5, 16. Oh, I'm sorry. John, John 5. John 5, 14. So Jesus had healed a man, and he has this very interesting conversation in verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. Sin and sickness are tied, folks. We have got to, what did James 5 say? Re confess your sins, that you can be forgiven and healed. What's Jesus telling this man who's healed? Don't keep doing those sins because they open the door to something worse happening to your body. Stop sinning. Same group that teaches it's not always God's will to heal is the same group that teaches that you can't stop sinning. These are doctrines of devils in the church of Jesus Christ. You yeah. must refute them. I know. They are not true. 1 Corinthians 11. I just want you to see that unrepentant sin absolutely absolutely opens the door to sickness and disease and death. Verse 26, it's all tied. To, why do you think Jesus bored in Isaiah 53? It's all tied. 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So they were getting drunk and being gluttonous with the communion wine and bread. That was this sin. What was the result of this sin, which shows us how sin works? Verse 28, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Is he talking to unbelievers? He is talking to the Christian church. These are Christians taking communion. And they're doing it wrong. They are getting drunk on communion wine and they're gluttonously eating the bread. This is supposed to be a somber like sip recognizing that you received the blood and a, and, a, and a little bit of bread where you realize that the body was broken for you. The blood for the forgiveness, the body for healing. That's what that is. It's not a, it's not a meal that you indulge in. It's one that you somberly take because you don't even deserve it. Do you understand? So they weren't doing that. So what happens? It says judgment came on them. New covenant, judgment came on them. For this reason, folks, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number asleep. If you take communion with bitterness in your heart, you're probably going to get sick. And I'm saying that based on scripture. I'm not speaking a curse over you. I'm warning you. You got, you got to do these things. Forgive people. If, you're, if, if you take communion wrongly with, before God, it can result in stuff happening. Right, right. The exact opposite effect. If Jesus bore those things for you, but you're just living in sin, they come back on you. That's why he says you're a weak, sick, and a number of sleep. That means died, by the way. Christians are dying because of their sin. In the Bible. It wasn't just Ananias and Sapphira. This is the church dying, like Old Testament style. For their sins. When Jesus actually bore them. Wake up. It can happen to you. Weak, sick, and a number of sleep. But if we judged ourselves. Everybody say judged ourselves. Judged ourselves. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. Why? Because judgment fell on Jesus. If you would just recognize your sin and repent and leave it. 
you would not be judged. Why? Judgment fell on Jesus. Isaiah 53, you bore our sickness, pain, sin, and death. That's the full gospel. You will not be judged because Jesus was judged. So if you're being judged, there's a problem in your life. You shouldn't be being judged by God. So if you are, figure out what's going on. Because Jesus bore it. So if you're bearing it, something's wrong. And Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, loves the church and is saying, here's why, folks. So for you, it might not be that you got drunk on communion wine, but it's something. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are being disciplined. We are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. For Christians, it's supposed to be a wake up call. That's what it's supposed to be. You'll be healed. We need to identify the sin. Unbelief is a sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, James says. Unbelief is sin. I'm guilty of the same. I'm not judging any of you. We have got to believe. What, how? 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 Read the word. Hear the word. Even right now, as this sermon has been being preached, your faith has increased. Because that's naturally what happens from the word being preached. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. It's a wake-up call from God. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. That's exactly what's happening. Not just to that man, it was happening to the church themselves. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Notice repentance also involves a change of behavior. And stop listening to Christians who say that repentance is just some kind of verbal confession and nothing else. Notice he says, stop eating the communion bread. Not only repent, stop eating it that way. Eat at home. Then come take the communion bread. You get it? Repentance is a change of behavior, folks. So apply this to yourself. Don't just go, oh, that's a nice thing. Apply this to yourself. Where, it might not be communion, where in your life is there need for repentance? And repent. And then change the behavior. Go now and leave your life of sin. Stop sinning so something worse doesn't happen. Because these promises are true. We're going to close with promises. I want to leave you on a, on a good note. Who wants to be left on a good note? Yes. Let's close with promises. Because the promises are yes, right? They're yes. So we've identified hindrances. Let's have some real prayer with the Lord. And let's, let's close with promises. Psalm 103, one of my very favorites. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Didn't James 5 just warn people wandering from the truth? David is saying the same thing. Don't forget these. Verse 3. Who pardons all of your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Yes. Did Jesus bear both? That's why both are offered. That's why David can offer both. The Holy Spirit is speaking through him. And David is saying God will pardon all sins and heal all diseases. That's the promise. That's the full gospel. There's nothing wrong. Just don't manufacture it. There's nothing wrong with healing. There's nothing wrong with signs, wonders, and miracles. I believe in that stuff. I've seen it. Just don't manufacture it. Just let it be real. He pardons all our sins. He heals all our diseases. If we don't see that, it's not because God's word has failed. Pray again. Keep studying. Keep dwelling in the word. Stick with it, man. When people take earthly drugs, they don't just do it one time. You usually have like, hey, you got to do this for 10 days or 15 days or what have you. Okay? Why don't you do the same with faith? Why do you give up after one prayer? Then you make a super bug. If you do that with antibiotics, it becomes a super bug. You know that? Yeah. People only take antibiotics for three days. Then it becomes a super bug. And then it's even harder to get rid of. Folks, Stop making a superbug out of these situations. Pray and keep praying and keep believing. Take your medicine daily. The scriptures say that God's word is medicine to our flesh. Proverbs 4. Take your medicine. If you do it with earthly medicine, how much more with spiritual medicine? 
who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. That's God's promise to you. I forgive all your sins. I heal all your diseases. I redeem your life. I buy it back from the devil. That's what redeemed means. He's buying you back. It's like Hosea with the prostitute, buying her out of prostitution. I redeem your life from the pit who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. I crown you with loving kindness and compassion. Folks, God is not a hard man. He's actually a kind man. If you're experiencing hardness, it's from unbelief. It's from hardness of heart. He wants to be kind and crown you with loving kindness and compassion who satisfies your years with good things, all kinds of good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So you feel young all the way to the day that he calls you to your new body at the resurrection. Youth all the way. That's what it says about Moses. And that was old covenant. It says that he died with the strength of a young man and that his eyes were clear. Isn't that beautiful? God gives the same promise to you, beloved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 107. I mentioned it earlier. Starting from verse 17. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them. Didn't we see that in Matthew 8? What did it say? He spoke the word and healed them all. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. This is the God we serve. Why does it say that the, men, the people were afflicted? It says because of their iniquities. It's always Adam. It's always Adam. What's God do? He's the Savior. When Adam wakes up and repents, see, they cried out to God. They're repenting. He sends forth his word and heals them. Even today, the fact that you can even receive what I'm preaching is God's mercy to you being demonstrated. Because not everybody preaches this. And even less people believe it. The fact that you can even comprehend it and believe it and accept it, that is God's loving kindness. He has sent forth His Word, and that means your healing has already begun. Because there's so many people who will just not believe the message that was just preached. And if you're even just mustard seeds starting to believe it, your healing has begun. Pray and pray and pray, believing and knowing that it is true. And you will receive what you ask for. That's exactly what Jesus promises in Mark 11. Believe. When you stand praying, believe that you have received it. And it will be yours. It will be granted you. Time is not a factor. Only His Word. That's the only factor. Does His Word say it? It is written? Then it is. Time's not a factor. Two seconds, 20 years. Time's not a factor. It is written. Jesus bore my sins. He bore my sickness. He bore my pains. He bore my death. Therefore, I am forgiven. I am healed. I have youth like, uh, I have youth renewed. And I'm alive. And even when this body dies for sin, It's only God calling me to my new body. I have life in me eternal. That is what Jesus has secured for me. That's the full gospel. Folks, other Christians need this, but we've got to walk in it ourselves and set an example. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, this this is a friendly warning. If you only listen to this message and you don't dive in on healing and keep yourself in the word, 
and building faith. Now, all of the word actually is healing to the body. You can be reading Isaiah and it be on, a, on Israel and it still is life giving as it goes into your body. But especially passages on healing itself, absolutely meditate and dwell on those. That's how you walk in these things. You got to hear it regularly and then believe it because faith comes by hearing. When Jesus was asked to increase faith, he spoke his word. He sent forth his word and healed them. Amen. Amen. How's that for a sermon titled God, Money and Miracles? Amen. Praise the Lord. Those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. We're so glad that you are here and that you stayed for the whole sermon and listened to the whole thing. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you know when we post new videos. Like this video, share it with your friends so that they can hear the word of God. And if you'd like to give and support this ministry, which is how we're able to do what we're doing, you can click the little heart icon down below the video screen uh, if you're on YouTube and you can give that way. Or you can give by texting the word GIVE to 386-753-7337. And when you give, you can select Ormond Church or Legacy Housing. Either's fine. If you give to Ormond Church, that helps us specifically with services. And you are helping to support the ministry either way. So we are very grateful for you. We're grateful you in person as well. Thank you. If you'd like to give, same way. Text and give to 386-753-7337. We love you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sabbath. You may be dismissed. <laughs>